Thank you, uh, JP, for the great introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, come back here and to tell you the research I've been doing the last decade or so, and also some of the future ideas I've been thinking. Some of them are early in the stage of uh, brainstorming, and then hopefully we're mature in the next year, many years, and uh, if not decades. So before I talk about specifics, and I uh, hope to show you a couple of pictures to appreciate uh, ocean cover 70, more than 70% of the Earth, uh, play a big role in uh, modulating our weather. We have, we moved to this place, we're not moving to other places, we have a reason, because the weather is nice, because it's close to the water. Uh, I show you here, once pictures here show you also ocean where play a big role in uh, creating uh, the typhoons and then in the Pacific, Indian Ocean, and Hurricane Atlantic. So this is the hurricane season. All these areas have a very warm water is where you're going to born a lot of the tropical storms. Uh, that have a huge impact to, uh, uh, to many places in the globe. So ocean uh, occupy uh, quite a bit of an uh, area in the Earth and that play a big role regulating our climate and the weather. Um, in addition to the weather day-to-day -day you are familiar with, ocean also play a huge role in regulate our climate. So um, the ranging from how the uh, weather evolve on a decade, decadal and centennial time scales, how the water is moving around, uh, ocean is, uh, is a big reservoir and then evaporate and then uh, eventually all the fresh water coming back to the ocean and then forming this complete water cycle. And also, I want to convince you, ocean have a lot of life as well, the being part of our carbon cycle. Uh, that's been talked about recently as the climate change and the carbon is a big picture as part of the Earth systems. Um, uh, I, fa I was fascinated by this picture because uh, we, we know very little about ocean and apologize for the busy diagram. It doesn't really matter specifically what it shows, just show you how complex and it's a remain the last frontier to be explored. So it's amazing how little we know about the ocean and life and then remain to be explored uh, in the many years or if not decades to come. So with that as a brief background, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my main research in computational science and engineering, uh, focus on ocean modeling, and then recently try to develop a new way of uh, predicting the ocean. Um, I will mention a few things and how the ocean modeling and prediction uh, coupled to other disciplines uh, in the interdisciplinary areas and how co computational science play a role and how do we extend the weather prediction to climate time scales and how we go from physics to fish and then how the ocean dynamics and physics and regulate uh, the ecosystem and how the ecosystem connect to fisheries and, and then to uh, the society. Um, one of the main things GPL is doing is satellite, uh, launching satellites and monitor Earth and other planets. So I will say a few words about the satellite oceanography I have been doing. Um, finally, I will mention a few of the ideas we just started a few years ago and it's going to be uh, very active areas of research and investigation in terms of ocean energy. Uh, ranging from how do you extract energy power underwater robotic all the way to how you think about commercial applications and then renewable energy. Our governor announced 33% renewable by 2020. Many other states have been doing the same thing. So I will say a few words about that in the end. So starting from the ocean predictions, I hope to uh, illustrate um, a kind of philosophical framework. Uh, we don't have to start from <coughs> scratch because the weather forecast community has been involved in the last almost 40, 50 years uh, I was, in, um, I was in, uh, at a meeting in Colorado last week, so I, before my trip, I just go to uh, Google and then find out what the weather looked like in the last week so I can plan my trip to Colorado. So basically you are getting what's the daytime temperature, what the rainfall look like, all the way to the next five to 10 days. This is, you type weather.com, this is the information you get, type zip code, the name of the place you're visiting, uh, beautiful place by the way. Um, so you can try to plan your, your trips according to the information you're getting. We take for granted, look in the TVs, USA Today, on the website, and then in the background, uh, there's all this national infrastructure developed in the last almost 50 years, starting from the first computer available 
Uh, it's not that hard to set up weather station. You can spend a couple hundred dollars to set up a weather station in your backyard. There are thousands of these weather stations enable the national infrastructure on the right-hand side to make this kind of national predictions. There's a National Weather Service uh, funded at almost over a billion dollars a year uh, by NOAA, National Oceanographic uh, Atmospheric Administration. Uh, that's giving you an almost like a national uh, weather prediction for the next week or so. And that information uh, is relatively coarse and then feed into many of the so-called private weather services and give you a customized uh, weather information, sometimes accurate, sometimes less accurate, but we know how to make decisions based on uh, uncertainty information. So last time I checked, there's uh, over 100 private companies providing this kind of customized services and estimated almost like $200 million a year business. And it's growing about 5% a year because the people's demands uh, talk about energy. People want to know uh, how much wind energy in the wind farm from the west side to the east side of the city. So they, you can see you have a tremendous of demands giving you information all the way to the county level if not the city level. That's not being provided by national backbone but it is provided by the private sector. This is a, a, a infrastructure has been evolving uh, almost from 50s to all the way to 70s and 80s since the first computer being used to do the national weather prediction eventually mature as a very st healthy, stable industry. So that's almost like a framework to guide us to, uh, to explore in terms of the ocean and climate predictions. Uh, another example I want to show you, uh, this is the El Nino prediction uh, system. Uh, when I started my graduate school in 85, there's only a few weather buoys uh, available. You can imagine it's easy to launch a balloon in the atmosphere and it's so hard to, to set up some kind of balloon equivalent to measure the uh, water uh, underneath. You can see kind of ship go to the equator. It costs you $20,000 a day, mm, ten, dozens of people to maintain it. It's hard work to do any work on this kind of environment. So by the time I graduated in the early 90s, you have about almost 100 buoys in the Pacific already. And that 100 buoys eventually feed those key information, almost like a weather station in your backyard, feed into a number of different computer models. Uh, this is the one I downloaded just uh, last week. Uh, it's the most recent forecast of El Nino's in the coming uh, several seasons. Anticipating kind of a small week to moderate El Nino is coming in the Christmas and then January, February time frame. So starting from the summer, you can see all these dozen models show a pretty consistent uh, El Nino is developing in the Eastern Pacific. If you're a fisherman in Peru, you'd better pay attention to this because El Nino comes, upwelling gets stopped, uh, food supply gets decreased, and you don't have many anchovies to catch. And those are the country need this fishing industry, over 50% of the national economy. So this is a really robust climate prediction. Is another example how the observing system, billions of dollars being invested uh, as a nation, and then feed into our understanding. You understand how the ocean atmosphere system works, and then eventually turn into a prediction capability. And that prediction can be provided to users like a fisherman and making decisions. Or the weather prediction for every user go to a trip. You bring your umbrella, you bring what kind of jacket you're going to bring coming from Southern California to a trip. Um, I mentioned ocean uh, monitoring is challenging simply because if you've ever been to sea, uh, it's not the research and uh, the vacation cruise ships you've been on. I, I cannot survive uh, the ship uh, measurements because it's, uh, um, it's, you can tell this is a picture a colleague of mine took and then uh, in the middle of the ocean it could be easily 10, 20 foot waves and then uh, flashing water back in the forest. Imagine you have to lower down this instrument from the boat to the bottom and then come back and then collect water samples along the way. Mm -hmm. is tr tremendous amount of uh, work and then challenging to work with. But in addition to the fish ones, there's a variety of different techniques uh, maturing very rapidly so we can start to think about uh, working as a discipline to turn into an operational oceanography like the weather prediction. Starting from the ocean satellite launch in the 70s, uh, if it's cloudy, you can have an aircraft and then to measure below the clouds. And these coastal radars you can buy really cheaply and then you can see the Doppler shift of ocean velocity. You can measure the ocean current, where it goes and the tides. Um, 
And also the traditional ships, and then you can put the buoys, and it's 5,000 pounds of metal, it's just dropped to the bottom, and then have an anchor, you can collect water samples. And to robotic vehicles, the last 10 years really have this kind of ocean gliders, ocean underwater vehicles, like little unmanned submarines can zigzagging in the ocean, collecting uh, data, and then sending satellites and GPS and know where you are. Uh, all the way to also we are start tagging the marine animals, try to, uh, to, to not only follow where they're going and also collecting information as they uh, dive as well. So I can, I, you can see in the last few years and then because of the maturity of these, uh, we also have constant demands of this information. And this is the one case I uh, got involved in a few years ago. Uh, the, for example, if you are a Coast Guard and a sailor lost in the sea, you get a call and you want to ha have a search rescue operation. Um, if, you, if you go out to California today, uh, say um, a, a, a few hundred kilometers offshore, uh, you, you, you don't really have a single place the Coast Guard can get this information. You have to go to dozens of different agencies and the website and then to, to collect information. And the best model so far the community can provide is on the order of have a pixel size of 10 kilometers, simply because the ocean is so, is so huge. Uh, imagine 10 kilometer pixel size doesn't really help the Coast Guards. Uh, so a few years ago, if, for those of you who know Jim Gray from Microsoft, uh, he, he got last phone call outside the Golden Gate in early 2007. A Coast Guard had been searching five days with this kind of limited information and finally they gave up and uh, we still don't have any information. Uh, so taking this example um, as a really motivation to ask the question, how do we provide this information if there's a similar case in the future? Can we propose uh, develop a single stop uh, place like a Google-like uh, information site, everything Coast Guard need to know? And then you can run the model to the scale really is useful to the users. So this is almost like a challenge after I get involved in this operation for a couple of weeks. Um, and then to start ask that question, how do you uh, integrate all these information and then to, pro to provide uh, a useful information, not only to Coast Guard and then oil spill response teams, water quality uh, monitoring agencies and all these resource managers and even educational engage, uh, public engagement. Uh, kids in Oklahoma may be interested in something in the ocean. Can you come up with a website? provide the information he or she want to learn. Um, so giving that as a set of the motivation, uh, it, this is where my research coming in is computational modeling. This model is really sitting in between the information we are collecting both from space, from the water, and to the users, not only the research users and also the application users. So the model is almost like an uh, integration uh, vehicle, kind of bridging the gap between these two. And so you can develop products and then issue the forecast. And a model, as I, I probably won't have time to mention earlier, just keep in mind, model also will tell you how to refine your observing system. So this is a kind of two-way feedbacks. How many of the buoys? How do you know 100 buoys is enough? You know, can you, if you have money, only a 420, what you can do? So the feedback between model observing systems also a very valuable exercise. Uh, how do you trade the importance between one data versus next? So this is where a uh, model can help you to quantify that kind of impact. Um, I will go through this very quickly. The ocean model is deal with uh, really the fluid dynamics. It's anything with, uh, can apply to the air, to the water. Uh, this is the Sovic Navistock equation. You're writing the rotation fluid. Uh, we call the geophysical fluid dynamics dealing with the computational CFD problem except on the rotating Earth. Uh, I highlighted these areas, depends on whether you want to model either the estuaries or rivers, which you have to keep all the vertical dimension, or you deal with kind of open ocean, coastal ocean, your horizontal scale is the kilometers, your depth scale is the meters, so you can kind of neglect, do a scaling analysis, get rid of some of the terms, and then turn out to become a two-dimensional velocity rather than three-dimensional velocity, so you can save tremendous amount of computational times. So in our community, we call it either hydrostatic with only this term, or non-hydrostatic, have every term combined, you have to solve the 3D velocity. So most of the results I'm presenting today is this hydrostatic limit. We're dealing with the coastal environment rather than rivers and the San Francisco Bay and the Sacramento River. Then you have to care about all these little terms. 
Um, it, given that continuous equation, you can say if I do uh, turn into a computer model, you have to digitize a certain form. You can digitize into a horizontal grid or a vertical grid. In a horizontal grid, in our case, is multi-scale. You can run nested models. You can have one area with very coarse grid and then start to refine your information as more detailed pixels. In the vertical, you can digitize into a depth level, your density level, or you can have a vertical coordinate follow the top uh, symmetry. Um, so you can choose either one of these depends on the problem you try to solve. For the climate problem, you try to digitize in the depth grid. I don't have to go to these details, but um, most of the time, water puzzles follow the density, constant density surface. So there's some advantage if you want to track the pollution, the dispersion of the certain tracers. You want to run a model with isopycnal surfaces, follow the density. And in the coastal environment, because uh, the topography is changing dramatically, both of these have large errors in the, trunk, in the digitization. So you want to follow the symmetry. In, other, in, in the model I'm presenting now is our vertical coordinate kind of follow the bottom seafloor. And that can give you a pretty accurate representation pretty close to the beach. It's not, not quite to the beach. Um, and then the schematic can think of it as a three-dimensional globe. You can digitize into these three-dimensional cubes. And then basically you follow each cube every time steps and see how it evolves. That's a simplistic way of uh, describing how this uh, model works. Uh, for the ocean, you have to deal with the forcing from the atmosphere, the boundary condition with the land. Uh, the model take into account how strong the wind blows, what kind of heat exchange with atmosphere at the boundary condition, what type of gravitation force and the tide into the system, um, what kind of rainfall as a freshwater input to the ocean so you can change in the salinity in the ocean. And then just taking into account the atmospheric forcing, the land boundary conditions, and if you have a big enough computer, and then you're ready to go, right? So basically, you ask the question, what information you want to you get from this kind of modeling system. Um, so what I'm presenting here is, uh, this is almost like an overarching question guiding my, this part of my research is to, how do you observe the system? How do you understand the system? If you understand the system well enough, can you try to predict and then with certain uncertainty? And that's, un that's prediction become a useful information. So that's the three main pillars of, the in of the my question. Uh, the approach we're taking is taking a test bed idea, you have to test in a small place. And uh, we have been, last um, a decade, we have been going back to this beautiful place in Monterey and then try to test out, uh, not only because of the, the place is great, you can play golf, with, with some people, and also because we have a lot of facilities in Monterey, and then there's a lot of oceanographic institutes. Uh, Monterey Aquarium have a lot of facilities. So we use a lot of their infrastructure to do our testing. This is almost like our laboratory, uh, filtery. And before you even talk about how do you do uh, this everywhere. So we has now our space like our lab in the last many years. Um, to even Monterey, in order to model Monterey, you have to think about what happened in the entire West Coast. picture showing the U.S. West Coast and then from uh, Monterey is right here, all the way to Oregon. You see, this is satellite images of the temperature. You see how complex it is. You have a lot of cold water in the blue area, representing more like lower 10 degrees centigrade. Uh, the warm water in the upper 10s and the 20s. And you see these so-called mesoscale eddies and the vortices. And it's a lot of this internal uh, tourist driven. You see a fairly complex phenomenon. And I have a spatial scope of tens of kilometers and uh, changing from hours to day. And also, you have been hearing when El Nino comes, the West Coast make a, uh, see the difference. So also, you need to know what happened in the background, which is on the Pacific Basin. So in order to predict material, you have to know what's happening in the Pacific as well. So there's a lot of the scale coupling between the different scales. And uh, if you want to know the climate time scale, now you can worry about the entire globe. How I don't know how many of you heard this conveyor belt circulation idea, the global ocean. Uh, to the first order move as a conveyor belt, the water Atlantic is sinking and then coming back and circulate the globe. So if you drop a tennis shoes in the water, it will come back to the same spot in a thousand years, roughly. So that's kind of a uh, climate time scale from decade to centuries. So it depends on the prediction time scale, the phenomena. You have to involve all these special skills you take into account and then um, build up into your comp computational models so you can have this kind of memory and a feedback to the phenomena you try to model. 
Um, supposed to, this is a movie, just uh, imagine this thing were move. And uh, this is a snapshot from the model we have been developing in the Pacific. This is, trust me, when you animate to the 97, 98, you will see El Nino here. It's warm water in here. So I have my, my computer. I will be happy to show you afterwards. Uh, we run this model at NASA Ames supercomputers and have this, I believe is six months ago, is the second fastest computer, have 50,000 comp processors um, uh, donated by Silicon Graphic, it's bankrupt by now. Um, so the model like this provides a large scale contact, as I mentioned earlier, simulating El Ninos. And then you can, almost like a Google Earth framework, you start to zoom in to the cities, to your house, to your pools, and then start in the same way you're developing models. The, now the 12 kilometer model is not good enough for Monterey. We developed these multi-skill models in our community. We call them nested models. It's almost one model nested within the next one. You can think about the tens of kilometers to a few kilometers, and then eventually you model this area of interest, Monterey, Santa Cruz, Monterey, at roughly a kilometer scale. So that's all the data we can collect from space, from ships, and then uh, taking the boundary condition from the parents. So think about this, the kids, the parents, the grandparents, and the great-grandparents, so you can continue to zoom in this multi-tile kind of framework. Uh, we do this because if you do a one-kilometer model of the globe, take, I estimate it take 100,000 computers. So we still don't have a computer to do this details at the, over the global scale, so we have to do a little bit of compromise, do this nested. We're not interested for the offshore or for the up up coast in the Washington or something. Um, so that, that's the modeling framework. Uh, and the next challenge is uh, how do you combine models with data? We call the data initial model initialization. How do you make sure your model uh, describe the, the ocean like today uh, in, in a good way? Um, the same thing in the weather prediction. You have to make sure you can reproduce weather today. You can predi predict into the future. That's the same philosophy. We call the data simulation. How do you combine data with models? Um, mathematically, it's pretty simple. If you da take data, take models, you do the difference. If they are different, you ask the question, what does it take to adjust the model so have the minimum errors for the model? So that's the so-called leapfrog minimization problem, except this dimension of this problem is huge. It's tens of millions of pixels. You have to follow them. So the three-dimensional minimization problem have several tens of million dimensions. So that's the only difference from the traditional estimating satellite trajectories or some orbital estimation. Those are thousands or tens of thousands. Now you talk about tens of millions. Um, so that really, on the every regular time, you have to make sure your model consistent with the data you have. So we, what do we call the incremental data simulation? This is exactly like a weather prediction. Every six hours, we compare the model with, with data. And then you, based on the d model data misfit, the differences, you do a least square estimation. You come up with a correction. So this correction gives you the minimum errors. That's the variational technique coming in. You estimate this every six hours uh, continuously. Hopefully, uh, gradually, your model trajectory will follow the observation trajectory. That's reality. It's not going to be perfect because your data have errors as well. You collect data, think, of, think about collecting data from moving ships, you know, have errors, right? Even measure temperature have errors, salinity have even larger errors, and the velocity measurement have even bigger errors. So those uncertainty have to be taken into account. We call the observational error covariance. And uh, data only collect in sporadic location. So how do you know what happened in between two measurements? That's where the model error covariance coming in, kind of spreading the information into a three-dimensional uh, globe. Uh, so that's kind of a schematic of the kind of model prediction cycle. Um, uh, I, I will skip this mathematics and just to give you an idea of the, the point I want to make. In order to do data simulation, it's not only the mathematical optimal estimation, it's also about following equations to do consistent with dynamics. So you have to make sure the correction you introduced follow the equations you have. So this, what we uh, usually follow is make sure the correction of the temperature is consistent with the correction of the velocity. We call the geostrophic balances. So the certain terms have to be balanced. Even though statistically you get a minimum error, if it doesn't follow the equation, you're going to have trouble when you, once you start a prediction. 
So that's kind of dynamic constraints we are getting at to. And there's uh, a couple of papers I'd be happy to share with you. I have a lot of details. Um, this is a schematic just to show you uh, the, the, the model uh, data simulation have a way to interpolate information. If you have information on the surface, we can extrapolate with depth. If you have information near the coast, away from the coast, they spread out information differently. This is kind of a, a graphic representation of error covariance. Uh, if you can see it in the open ocean, you spread inform information or a bigger distance. When they're near the coast, the phenomena have much smaller spatial scales, you spread out information differently. Along the coast, spread out differently uh, across the coast. So that's kind of three-dimensional visual representation of, a, of an error covariance. It's a three-dimensional form. Um, I mentioned Monterey. We, we test it in such a way we ask dozens of PIs to come in together, bring your own gadgets. Some people come in on ships. Some people bring the gliders, going to deploy the ocean, and the propeller vehicles, and then underwater robotic. And some people fly airplanes. So all this information going to collect into a central command. Uh, this is a 30-day time record of the data we're collecting. So uh, everybody warming up, and by the, by the, uh, after one week or two, you can see we all will almost get 1,000 measurements over this small area. So all this information, imagine, go to a computer model. It's going to issue a forecast. And after a couple of weeks, we all are retired. We come back, we go home. Uh, so this kind of uh, field test we have been doing over three times in the past, 2003, 2006, and 2008. And it's primarily funded by Office of Naval Research in the Navy want to characterize Monterey, the challenges they say. Imagine someone invite, invade Monterey. I want to know the information. Give me all the information I need. So this kind of scenario, uh, we pretend we're going to uh, understand it and predict the systems. Um, I will quickly go through some of the results. And then you can imagine this is observation. This is your predictions. You can compare the two. Uh, what do I want to emphasize the modeling also have this very powerful function is to allow you to do uh, the trade studies. You ask the question, uh, what kind of temperature salinity measurements can tell you? What kind of velocity measurement can tell you? In other ways, I can compare if this is a, gr if this is a prediction you want to make, uh, to what extent you need to send temperature salinity sensors versus velocity sensors. So you can do this kind of simulation experiment to say you even have a finite amount of money and you want to buy instrument A or buy instrument B. So this is, I can do a lot of these simulation studies to answer that kind of questions. Uh, this is one slide just to show you not only you can passively receiving information, your forecast can also be used by uh, the field operators to deploy new instruments. Uh, we are doing so-called ensemble predictions. In other words, you can perturb your initial condition. Rather than make one deterministic prediction, you can make a dozen. So that the divergence from this dozen deterministic predictions will tell you the errors, uncertainty of your forecast. So this is uncertainty maps. And where you have red, you have bigger uncertainty. And you can, based on this uncertainty, say, where am I going to send my robots to the ocean to collect more data? You can call your operator, say, get one of these gliders and drop in the water, and then cutting across this bigger uncertainty area. So we did this 2006. You can see this is one week go here and the one week another there. And then if you take this data into your model, this is the error reduction you see. So in other words, rather than send another robot blindly anywhere in the ocean, and you want to maximize the impact of these particular instruments. So that's another function this model can be used to, um, we call it adaptive sampling or targeted observation. If you want to have finite amount of sensors, where are you going to send them? So the modeling system will also help you to design and refine your uh, observing systems. Um, so once we're happy with our lab, lab test and the field test, and we did a very um, um, so-called brief attempt about two years ago and running this real time. So we started about 2007 to run the Southern California coast. This is our bike home. San Diego is right here. Santa Barbara is right here. So to ask the question, can we do a 27 prediction, like the weather prediction? So this is what we call experimental forecasting system, because you cannot take this product and sue us if you think it has large errors. You didn't find the fish you want. So it's in the, still in the experimental mode. Once it's successful, we give to the federal government like NOAA, and they will be the official forecasters or private company, because you, don't, you cannot sue them. right? 
Um, so this is every six hours you can get any variables in the in the system. Get a temperature, salinity, velocity, sea levels. Uh, you look at the wind conditions. So we have an atmospheric model downscale on a few kilometers. This is the model running on a one kilometer in this area. Uh, you can comp validate our system. It's fully automated system. Uh, you can check uh, how to agree with the velocity, agree with the temperature, and um, and this is just a one snapshot. All of these pictures you can download from the website. It's, it's completely the transparent, automated running uh, every six hours. Uh, for this, every day you can see this particular instrument is gliders underwater. They can just glide up and down. Uh, like this, and they're collecting temperature salinity along the way. You can see this glider coming to coast Santa Barbara take about four days and then reach to the land. And then you can go to the website and see how well we're doing. And then what's the difference? What's the uncertainty? And the difference between red and black, uh, the blue picture, show you the impact of this particular data. So the red is the errors of temperature, one degrees, and then before you use this data, after you use this data set, you see the errors reduce to almost a half a degree or less. So that's give you an automatic picture of the impact of this particular data sets. And it is all published real time. And then we have tons of users. Um, just give you a few examples and turn out a lot of USC. Cut off, sorry if I cut off here a little bit. So, um, so there's several, at least I can think of four different users from USC using this kind of framework. Uh, I give you one example. This is a Ryan Smith. and in the computer science robotic embedded system labs, and David Curran and Bert Jones in the biological science in this center of integrated network aquatic platforms. Basically, they take this our website. You go there. They drop a lot of particles in the water, and they try to ask the question where the particle goes. And that's try to characterize if there's a plume in the water, where it's going to disperse. And the USC, this center, have two underwater gliders. They want to optimize. If there's two gliders, how do map this particular poem and the boundaries? And then this is Ryan Smith coming to our portal, <laughs> design a particular strategy, kind of maximize the uh, observing area of this uh, platform. So it's a very, I'm glad it's being used on a routine basis. Uh, there's another uh, graduate student of so Bill uh, Barrison from Earth Science. And then to uh, develop an uh, uh, aquaculture site based on the circulation, make sure the larvae, the fish uh, seed is not being advected too far away from the, from the farm and so forth. Um, uh, working with uh, Eva Demon from ISI, and then try to automate our workflow because it's an end to end 24 7 system. I uh, have a so called a Pegasus workflow software. I've been, she has been investigating how to apply to this. I've been working with Cyrus. How do you visualize the three-dimensional flow? Uh, disappointed with Google Ocean because you still cannot do 3D visualization. Um, there's a, a continue to be a challenging question. How do you visualize this three-dimensional information? What, what I'm going to do? Say no? Just say no, right? Um, so I was in Alaska a month ago, just finished this field campaigns. Um, uh, just uh, try to testing how do you develop the system in another environment. Uh, took us about three years to come up with Alaska predicting system. Focus on Prince William Sound. And this is a, a nine kilometer model, three and one. If you've never been there, it's a beautiful place, Prince William Sound. See all the college glaciers there. And there is 20 year, this is 20 year anniversary of the Exxon Well D oil spill. You can see the oil spill in the Prince William Sound, how many days and how the spread of the oil. So we developed this system, asked the question, if there is oil spill today from Well D, the port, all the way to Long Beach, the tanker coming every day, and then what information we can provide. So we just came back from the field. Again, this, this is another movie. Imagine it moves, and then this fresh water coming from Columbia. Uh, this, uh, this is the Copper River. The salmon is beautiful. Um, so this, uh, have this purple blue is the fresh water. You can see all these glaciers and uh, uh, rivers produce a lot of fresh water and how we track with time. Um, let's keep moving. Um, this is the one we release drifters. So you release marker in the ocean, use GPS to uh, uh, track where it goes. And now we, have, we issue ensemble forecast every day. This is the same particle release and then drifted by a dozen different model predictions. You can tell this, this is a starting position, this is an ending position. So the different ending position give you an idea how uncertainty 
the model prediction will be. So this uncertainty can be used by Coast Guard or spill responders and try to plan how many helicopters you need and then try to characterize how dynamic the systems are and then introduce uncertainties. So it's just really hard to predict where this particle will go. So that's kind of an experience we have from Prince William Sound. Um, very quickly, um, we, once we have this fundamental framework to do uh, physical dynamical predictions and how that can be applied by other uh, disciplines. I have a number of collaborators. Uh, this is more competitional challenges and then ask the go back to the Navy question. Mon nobody going to invade Monterey. The fundamental question is you want to lend the Monterey and then say, if I have an operation here, tell me about the information as detailed as you can. If you zoom in Google Ocean today, there's nothing you can find there other than how deep oceans are. So really the challenge is, what does it take to provide a three-dimensional information changing continuously from weather days all the way to the decades? And that could be a de decade work to get there and then to uh, provide this very heavy computational problem every six hours globally. So anybody can zoom in the glo globe. Maybe, maybe Google have another, another company like Google at those days, and then zoom in, you get every information you want. So imagine this pro particular problem where generate <coughs> three terabytes of data, any snapshots. Take about a snapshot <coughs> of the three-dimensional ocean, that's three terabytes right there. And, and how do you compute that? Take about 100,000 computers to compute that particular problem. So still cannot do today, but uh, with cloud computing and other technology advance, I'm pretty sure 10 years from now, we'll be there. So 10 years from now, another website of the ocean probably will, will get you there. And then people can take this information, make decisions. It's happening, you know? Weather forecast in the 20, 30 years ago is still a fantasy. The first time in the 80s, start to do two-day forecast. Compu as this is the curve of the computational speed, how many petaflops and then gigaflops. And you can see you can do weather prediction in three days. There's a lot of other breakthroughs in the medical, astronomy, as you can see how the PC market, how the supercomputer evolved. And then I'm sure this, the, we can follow the pharmaceutical, the structure biology. We're going to make breakthrough as we push this curve into the future. So we are pretty close to enable ocean predictions on the different scales. Um, more importantly, um, you can also c need to connect with the climate time scale as well. What I mentioned to JP early on, if in a climate change environment, the community had pretty good consensus what temperature looked like in the globally. So this is the global temperature from 1880 to today. And then if you take the older climate predictions, uh, the best state of art climate predictions, we call the IPCC models, there's no Nobel Prize winning committee, and I have this uh, two dozen different models forecasting temperature in California, Southern California and Los Angeles showing here the temperature from 1950 to 2100. So you can see the model is pretty consistent. They all show warm somewhere between one degree to two and a half degree. Uncertainty is there, but at least you'll tell it's all warming up in the Calif Southern California. But this is the same model doing the precipitation, how much rain we're gonna have. So you're gonna have 2050. I'm not even sure we have more rain or less rain. So this is the state of art. Nobel Prize winning climate projections. So just tell you how much challenge when you answer regional questions from the global questions. The global temperature is rising, but we don't really know, 2100, whether we have more rain or less rain based on the state of art models. That's where we call the regional downscaling coming in because the climate model I showed you earlier have 100 kilometer pixels. So their pixels really don't really tell. San Diego, Santa Barbara is the same thing. So really you have to get into the local areas to address all these important societal questions. You need to downscale to the relevant pixels on the older kilometer, if not better, and how many dry years or wet years we have, what kind of snow pack we're going to have in the winter so we can affect the water supply. Uh, sea level rise, is that steady for a decade or rising in the next decade? How many heat, heat wave days and then related to the health and the air quality? How many fires? We just survived the fires. And do we have more Santa Ana events in the warm climate? And how that affect the fire, the air quality? And then so certainly the energy. And how that can affect the wind farm, the offshore uh, energy uh, farms we're going to set up in the next decade or two. 
Um, this is uh, all important questions uh, need to be addressed looking into the future. We cannot address these questions today with the computer models, but hopefully in the next decade we can. We can take the climate change scenarios downscale to the relevant scale so we can answer practical questions. Um, uh, coming back to very fundamental picture of the fisheries, the marine ecosystem, uh, in addition with the ship getting better, you have more fish, there's a lot of climate change signal as well. How do you set quotas and then regulate fishery industry and then monitor our ecosystem? Um, this is the one example how uh, the El Nino indice is showing on the top panel affect anchovies uh, on the Peru coast. This is the million mag mag metric tons of the anchovy you're going to catch. Uh, you can see actually every red here represents El Nino. You see 82, 83, that's a big El Nino. 97, 98, the biggest in the century. You can see every El Nino, you'll see a dip of the population and trophies. On top of it, you have this very complex decadal modulation as well. And how do you understand this decadal changes where it make a big difference? How do you project into the future for the Peru coast? Um, so we have been making a little bit of progress linking physics with the biology and the ecosystem. This is kind of box diagram, how do you translate the physics into silicate, phosphate, nitrate, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and eventually air sea CO2 fluxes, and how do you uh, look at the response of iron, you dump iron in the ocean, how this uh, sucks CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, let's compare data. This is the satellite data from images in Monterey. This is the model simulations. So we start to extend from physics to the biology and chemistry and the marine ecosystem. Um, we just uh, made a first attempt to forecast the anchovy population. Uh, you can take the velocity, you can uh, direct larvae, and then try to find how they survive. And then for those lucky ones to survive <coughs> the ocean flow, and then you can have enough food to feed them to grow and all the way modeled to the death. So this is the individual base model. Um, I think it cut it off in the, pot, in the top. It's called IBM, individual base models. Link physics all the way to uh, the fish behaviors and then the, until, until their life cycle for a few years. And using velocity to drift the larvae and the plankton productivity to feed them. So this is a, our predicted concentration of uh, anchovy. And if you take a slice, and then you can see the depth distribution from surface to 100 meters, where you have the most uh, anchovies. Um, don't tell the fishermen, so it's not supposed to tell them. Um, another area we have been collaborating is to work with the marine ecology system uh, community and try to uh, leveraging marine tagging. Uh, so you can put a very small tag into these marine animals. They not only tell you what the environments are, this is the elephant seals, the conductivity, and then measure temperature and salinity. And also you can try to correlate this environment they are in and then with the behaviors they have. In other words, uh, why they go to here, and why they stay there for two months and diving all the time. Why they dive to 200 meters, not 300 meters, and so forth. And we start to validate this kind of data collected by the marine animals. And it's very impressive. This is uh, the model from between Monterey, our model, compared with uh, tagging data collected by the sea lions, California sea lion. From time to time, the California sea lion comes to south, and then, but eventually it will go to Santa Cruz and Monterey. They like that area. And it's pretty consistent of our model estimation independent measurement from sea lion. This is a uh, signal uh, measured by communicators through uh, cell phones. Um, finally, I want to mention one of the areas I've been working uh, in addition to temperature, sea level winds we can measure today. We also, I'm also involved in this salinity satellite for the last almost 10 years. This is what I'm a project scientist and it's one of the passion to make this satellite uh, working. Uh, is everything working so far is going to be launched 2010, hopefully a year from now. It's one of the missing pieces. You can measure temperature from space, but you don't know what salinities are everywhere in the ocean. Uh, temperature salinity, um, this is a plot of the temperature versus salinity, and that determines the, how heavy the water density is, uh, how heavy the seawater. You know the seawater, the weight of the seawater determines how the ocean circulation moves. Almost like uh, you don't know hot where it rises and understand atmospheric circulation. You want to know how heavy the water is so you can know the three-dimensional ocean flow. It's really the gravity, try to 
try to drive all the ocean flow. But knowing the salinity <coughs> on the sea surface is one of the missing pieces of observing system. It, our concept is two decades old. Uh, take engineer a decade to figure out you can do this kind of measurement. It's very weak measurement. Basically, you have a, a huge microwave radiometer, very accurate radiometer. I'm fortunate to involve this from very beginning, uh, almost 10 years by now, working with a very small group of people for the last decades. Uh, we see how we start testing. Again, this is our laboratory. We build a swimming pool near outside the mountains here. You can see this PVC pipe from Home Depot. You can mix the water. You can dump salt in there. It's a very controlled experiment. And you put an instrument right there. And there's no influence, right? There's no wave. There's no winds. You can perfectly vari validate the signal. So in other words, uh, for the salinity and different temperature, what kind of brightness temperature you can measure. That's what the radiometer is going to measure. Almost like go to your doctor's office, you take your air temperature without really touching your skin. That's exactly the same thing, except you have to measure really accurate. And uh, we, we're happy with the lab test and move on space uh, aircraft. That's the, almost like a qualification before you can convince someone to invest a couple hundred millions to launch these satellites. You can see this is a six-foot colleague here. We put on a C-130. And then you have to keep the door open because this thing have to ma look at the sea. Um, so, we, so we've been flowing aircraft a couple of times in Monterey and then fully validated. I wasn't on the plane, I'm afraid. If C-130 with the door open, this doesn't sound so very attractive. So I want the boat to measure satellite vi ocean salinity, kind of calibrate the instruments. Um, after the 2003 measurements, we finally convinced NASA to fly this uh, spacecraft. Is everything in order? It's going to launch in Wunderberg Air Force north of Santa Barbara about a year from now. So it's very exciting to see how this concept from the beginning to the lab test to the field test all the way to spacecraft and uh, hopefully returning useful information and a good data set for the research community. So that's a couple of uh, items I've been doing in addition to my computational areas. Um, in the last few minutes, I do want to mention a few of these topics I've been involved in terms of ocean energy, uh, starting from uh, very interesting robotic vehicles to uh, potential uh, applications. Um, in order to model, uh, monitor the, the Earth, uh, the, you have to know how much ocean uh, temperature is changing. Ocean absorbs a lot, not only carbon, uh, is a heat reservoir as well. So you need to know pretty accurately how the temperature is changing in the ocean uh, the, in order to quantify how much temperature is changing in the Earth. So in the last almost like 5 to 15 years, the community built up these so-called uh, uh, float programs. Uh, this is a little device. The only thing they can do is sink up and going up and down. They can measure the temperature uh, over the water column all the way to 2,000 meters. Um, by monitor from surface to the bottom, you can, you can, you can pretty much uh, uh, see how much ocean is warming as part of the climate change. It's amazing so far, we have been launching more than 3,000 of these in the water, and each one of these, about $20,000 each. They only last about three years because the battery has to push water in and out to enable them to go up and down. So that's one of the limitations about five years ago. I was motivated to ask the question, how do you make this thing go last longer? You know, not only pollute the ocean with a piece of uh, metal, and then you, you see, imagine how much money you're going to save. You continue to monitor this climate system a decade or, you, or even longer. So that's the concept. Uh, I work with a group of engineers, and then we are uh, making, this is a prototype uh, engineering snapshots uh, model. We're making one of these uh, right now, doing testing. We're going to deploy this um, in November and December. Uh, it will be the, hopefully it will be the, the first underwater robot powered by natural temperature differences. In other words, uh, the ocean is warm and surface uh, cold at depths. So by moving this vehicle up and down, um, you're going to har harvesting this thermal energy. It's pretty small. Every dive we are targeting harvesting about two watt hours. So imagine how you can find what we call the phase changing materials. This phase changing materials are going to change from solid to liquid as moving the uh, 10 degree temperature difference. Uh, by converting this temp thermal energy into this volume changes mechanical energy, you can devi devise a little um, energy harvesting device and then to recharge your battery. So that's the whole concept is to 
as the vehicle move up and up and down, you generate enough energy to power your buoyancy engine as well as you power your sensors and cell phones and GPS to send the data into, uh, into the command center. So that's kind of uh, a concept is founded by the Navy uh, three years ago. Uh, we are a couple months away from the field test deployed this. The goal is to last um, uh, 200 dive, which is uh, diving 200 times. That's the maximum dive you can, you can uh, rely on a, a battery. So once you're beyond those 200 dives, basically this is a perpetual dive machine under the water because they, every dive they have a sufficient energy to make sure you make the next dive. So that's pretty exciting uh, in terms of the potentials to deploy this over many parts of the globe. And the potential is tremendous. You can start to put in propellers on top, and you can tell uh, even winds, the gliders. You can even think about how to move this from one place to the next. Um, even think about un unmanned vehicle, kind of cross Atlantic, cross Pacific, go around the globe. Uh, if you make big enough, maybe someone can build a little submarine, you can do a sail. There's no, no need to get the wind power, solar power. There's nothing in the ocean. But uh, the thermal energy probably will power these vehicles. So the implication was tremendous. So we are pretty excited to, uh, um, to have the integration we're going to test uh, in a few months. Um, in, in the community, almost like a competition, who had these battery-powered gliders to cross Atlantic? Right now, if you go to this Rutgers website, this is the second attempt by this group try to cross Atlantic with a single pack of battery. There's no recharging station. So they released it about a couple months ago, and almost um, a quarter, three quarter way across. So they uh, can see they are very optimistic. They will reach Spain, uh, will be the longest flying unmanned underwater vehicles. So they break the records right here. It's 5,700 kilometers. So they are, every kilometer they go, they break their own records. So uh, hopefully they'll reach there. And they have enough battery, so they're almost 73% there, and they use less than half the battery. So they, the vehicle in the middle pack is all battery. So uh, it's pretty exciting. The community uh, watch them. Uh, the potential for the energy harvesting is you don't need battery at all because ocean have a lot of energy itself. So that's my goal is to have the first glider to go around the globe someday, and then you make big enough, someone can sit in there, and then maybe look at the coral reef and dive and so forth. And then you don't need to recharge them. No nuclear power required. <laughs> um, final slide is, uh, as, lot, as this three-year project, we develop a number of different, we call the components technologies, not only power the gliders. The main technology we develop is different pumping processes, because uh, we need to understand how to pump water from one place to the next, and how to have very efficient energy generation mechanisms. Uh, one of the concepts we have been approaching, a number of sponsors already have two patents in place, uh, try to apply this technology into a commercial uh, implication. Ocean have a huge amount of potential. This is terawatt hours per year. Uh, it's on tap uh, in, r at this moment. You know, people talk about solar, biofuel, wind farms offshore wind maybe, but ocean energy still considered is very costly, very difficult to implement logistically, and any metal in the water is going to be challenging. You know how salty water is going to do with the metals, and then ocean is always a challenging environment to do. So our concept is fundamentally different, is we are not generating energy in the water. That's make all the current technology failed, because you, the generating water Generating energy in the water is just extremely challenging. So what we design this work is to develop really a good pumping technology. So we're going to pump the, wa the, the pressurized fluid to shore. So we generate uh, all the energy on the shore station rather than under the sea. So this is always almost like a hydrodynamic hydro, hydro dams and then move into the shore. And except you have the uh, efficient way of pumping. Uh, with uh, very efficient motors and then understanding the ocean environment. So we have been approaching a number of sponsors still pretty early in the stage and hopefully we can continue to explore. And as I mentioned, different states setting different target. Our governor set up 33% by 2020 renewable energy. None of these going to solve the problem, but it's going to help um, mitigate uh, the issue. And hopefully the, all these small renewable will add up to 33% in, in the near future. So. I will stop here and then my email and phone number.
Thank you very much.